Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, I will be starting. We're, we're going to be discussing uh, non-invasive imaging and the evaluation of acute chest pain. I will be starting and followed by Dr. Q, who will be going over some uh, um, how we can use echo uh, in the evaluation. So um, just to kind of get this conversation going, you know, I think all of us can relate to this. Uh, here's a case, 64-year-old with hypertension, diabetes, so it has typical age, risk factors, presents to your emergency room with chest pain. Uh, initial cardiac enzymes are negative, and you can kind of see, you know, the initial information you have is a baseline EKG and usually a chest X-ray as well. So this is kind of the setup for this talk. Um, I will be discussing how we can use imaging in the evaluation of our patient, and then specifically the studies and trials that I'll be presenting are randomized control trials. So there'll be, you know, data that has been we've learned from you know, uh, major randomized control trials in the literature. So let's talk a little bit about acute chest pain. It's really, believe it or not, the second most common cause for ED evaluation. Um, so I think, you know, going into cardiology is a good choice. Yeah, you know, there's obviously a lot of business out there. Uh, more than 8 million visits for, to the ED with acute chest pain cost to the system over 10 to 14 US, uh, billion US dollars. So tremendous cost. And believe it or not, the vast majority of these people who show up, less than 5% have acute coronary syndromes. So this is really a game of trying to very rapidly um, risk stratify patients. Those patients who really need admission and need further evaluation from those who are the vast majority where really you know, they can probably be discharged, discharged home in a very short period of time. And the goal in all of this is try to make sure that you don't miss any acute coronary syndromes. And the goal as, you know, the, the, uh, here in, with, uh, according to the guidelines, our goal is less than 1% missed, missed risk of an acute coronary syndrome. And the reason for that is back in the 1990s, um, patients, unfortunately, were being discharged with acute coronary syndromes, and this is associated with two phenomena. One is, you know, patients who have missed ACS have an exceptionally high mortality, and then the second thing is uh, chest, missed, uh, misdiagnosed chest pain is the number one um, liability factor for physicians. So uh, very, very important for us. Now, if you look at the 2014 ACC guidelines as to how you should evaluate somebody with acute chest pain, hopefully uh, this is all familiar to all of us in the sense that this is what we do bread and butter every single day. Most of the time they get admitted to a chest pain unit or some sort of telemetry unit. You perform serial EKGs and cardiac troponins at, you know, every six hours. And then if you have normal EKGs and normal troponins, you have a couple, you have choices. You can do a treadmill EKG, you can do a stress myocardial perfusion imaging, you can do stress echocardiography, and these are all, you can do it in the hospital stay, or if you feel they're very, very low risk, you can even consider letting these patients go home, but however, you have to have them tested within 72 hours. That's, that is in the guidelines. The guidelines also have two other tests that are available where you don't really need serial EKGs and serial troponins. That is CT angiography and rest myocardial perfusion imaging. So really, all of these things, you know, in the next few slides is, you know, where my focus of my discussion will be, talking about these different imaging modalities and how we can use them to better risk stratify our patients and identify patients who are truly low risk from those who are truly high risk. So let's talk a little bit about tr exercise treadmill testing. Um, you know, um, this is a technique that has been out around for uh, forever. Uh, there's been multiple studies. This number of 3,000 patients is actually incorrect. There's been studies with more than 100,000 patients. I'll show you some of the data. Um, it has been shown that if you have a normal treadmill test um, in an observation unit, you have a very high negative predictive value for Q coronary syndromes. So it's actually a very reassuring test. And then furthermore, the METs that you get from it and the Duke treadmill score provide further prognostic power. 
Some of the advantages to this test are you can, it's available, most places will have a setup to do it, it's easy to do, it's safe, we're all used to doing it. Uh, disadvantages are, of course, that you have to have a patient who's capable of exercising, so if they have orthopedic problems, you know, and they don't achieve this 85% of peak heart rate, you know, you kind of have a non-diagnostic test. Then also you have to have an EKG that's interpretable. So if you have baseline EKG changes, um, um, uh, you know, it's very hard to interpret ST changes if you already have baseline EKG uh, changes. And then as I will show you is, it turns out that compared to our imaging test, this is really a subpar, a significantly inferior test for diagnosing coronary artery disease. So where, you know, the literature, where things really started changing, where we started using more and more imaging um, with our stress modalities was when this was published in 1989. This was a meta-analysis of 140 studies, uh, all looking at stress EKG and comparing it with invasive cornea angiography, and included almost 24,000 patients. And what they found was, when looking for a coronary stenosis of greater than 50%, your sensitivity uh, for this test is really, you know, average at 68%, and your specificity was also uh, not significantly better. And in fact, in females, it was shown that, you know, th that they actually have worse diagnostic accuracy compared to men. So this was really the beginning where, you know, we started figuring out that, you know, this, this test, although it can help us clear out the emergency room because it does have a high negative predictive value for acute coronary syndromes, problems with it are not all patients qualify for the test. And then when it comes to actually diagnosing coronary artery disease, it does a horrible job. So, uh, and then hence comes these, all these other test options that you guys are all so, I guess, fortunate to have at our institution. You can really play around with any of these tests that you have. Most sites, um, these, the choice of tests that you use for imaging is really based on the local expertise and the local technologies you have available. We're very exceptional here where you have the opportunity to see all of them. Uh, these studies can be performed, uh, other than CT, all these studies are performed with exercise or some sort of pharmacological stress. They have been clearly shown to have higher diagnostic accuracy than exercise treadmill testing. And in general, when you compare the techniques, I, you know, we won't get too much into it. In general, they all kind of function the same. Perfusion imaging a little bit more sensitive, uh, wall motion assessment a little bit more specific. Uh, they all have ne excellent negative predictive value for detecting acute coronary syndromes. And then they actually provide value-added information to your treadmill, which include things like LVEF, localizing, um, um, and the extent of where your ischemia is. And some of these techniques can actually look for other causes of chest pain, like dissections, pericardial effusions, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So my, the rest of my talk really will now be going into, you know, some of the data of why these tests came to being and all from randomized controlled trials. So the first um, part of the story, the first imaging test which really um, was evaluated for evaluation of acute chest pain was rest myocardial perfusion imaging. And as you guys know very well about the ischemic cascade, one of the first features in the ischemic cascade is a perfusion abnormality. So the concept is that if your patient is ischemic, is having chest pain, is ischemic, if you give a radio tracer, there should be an area of the heart where you see a perfusion defect. And that would indicate, you know, ischemia. And so many studies already were showing that if you did rest myocardial uh, perfusion imaging in acute myocardial infarction settings, it had an exceptionally high negative predictive value. That if your rest myocardial perfusion image was normal, those patients did not have infarcts. And this is just an example of one of the early studies. You know, um, if, you, um, if you can take a look here, you'll start seeing this inferior wall defect in the short axis cuts. You can see the inferior wall defect here in the two chamber. Uh, images and sure, this was just again at rest, patient with active chest pain. You know, sure enough, they took him to the cath lab and there was a problem with the right coronary artery. Uh, 
But the real study which kind of put rest myocardial perfusion imaging on the map in acute chest pain population was the ARACE trial in 2002. And basically this was a large study, 2,500 patients, seven centers. And what they did was they randomized patients to, in the emergency room, either a rest myocardial perfusion image or standard of care. And standard of care would be whatever the physician wants to do, and that included stress EKGs. And their primary endpoint was, did it improve clinical decision making? And you know, the graphs here, the table here on the right are a little bit complicated. I've tried to highlight you know, where your eyes should go. But in general, what they showed was that if you use myocardial perfusion imaging instead of, instead of what they considered to be standard of care, you, um, you were able to appropriately reduce admissions in patients um, who, were, who were without acute coronary syndromes. So all the patients who have acute coronary syndromes were accurately identified, and in those patients who did not, not have acute coronary syndromes, in that patient cohort, which as we know is the vast bulk of patients, those patients were sent home in, um, earlier with less hospital admission rates than those patients um, 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 who had the standard of care. So this was a test now that allowed you to give you a lot of confidence that if I see a patient and I do this test and it's normal that I can send my patient home safely and I can you know, clear the emergency room and prevent an unnecessary admission. So this is from, from this study is really where you know, rest my, myocardial imaging began and specifically rest myocardial perfusion imaging. So one of the questions is, you know, why don't we do it anymore? I mean, um, you can. Uh, if you have a patient uh, who is actively having chest pain, they have to be having active symptoms. And the reason is because the fear is that if they've stopped having chest pain, let's say, you know, like often happens, or they get some anti-ischemic drugs, well, then your perfusion is restored, and, you know, this study will be a false negative. So you want to have a patient who's actively having symptoms. You can call us, call the lab. The difficulty is maybe acquiring a tracer dose, but if they have it and if it's in a reasonable part of the day, you can literally, we'll inject your patient while they're having acute chest pain, image them immediately and tell you whether there's any portion of the heart that's not getting blood flow. Um, difficulties are, of course, this radio tracers are available only during a fixed portion of the day. They're not available at night. And, um, um, you know, that, that was the, uh, and your patient has to be having acute symptoms. Most of the time, chest pain is resolved by the time they get to us. Um, so, uh, you know, so that was the rest myocardial perfusion imaging. And then most of y'all are very familiar with actual, you know, the rest stress protocols or our general, you know, stress myocardial perfusion imaging. So, um, Really, where most of the data for this comes from is this one trial, and relatively recent, 2013. <coughs> Remember, I'm showing you studies that are randomized control trials. There is a body of evidence with retrospective data, and I'll show you our own retrospective data. But if you want to tr truly look at randomized control trials, this is the solely, only one out there. Uh, 1,500 ED patients, acute chest pain, randomized two to one to stress myocardial perfusion imaging, or standard of care. And primary outcome was MACE, secondary outcome was hospitalization rates, and basically what they showed was that if you used stress myocardial perfusion imaging compared to standard of care, which at most was treadmill testing or whatever the physician wanted to order, there was really no difference in MACE, so it tends to be a very safe test. But in the stress MPI population, you significantly lowered hospital admission rates. And any of you all who've attended these administrative meetings now, this is a big deal to clear patients quickly out of the emergency rooms to prevent unnecessary admissions um, um, in, in order for cost savings. So this was one uh, study that showed it. And, um, and in this study, the stress MPI was also shown to be an excellent gatekeeper to the cath lab. It actually lowered in, uh, 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 in, invasive coronary angiography. And those patients who actually went for invasive coronary angiographies with positive stress MPIs actually had 
um, um, a real disease. So it's, uh, it showed that, you know, one, it works, and that it's a good gatekeeper, too, to the cath lab. And then if you looked at, in this study, if you just looked at the, you know, diagnostic accuracy of stress myocardial perfusion imaging, you can see that here the negative predictive value, meaning if I tell you your nuclear is normal, it is, it's excellent. Um, so uh, both at 30 days and w one year in this trial. So, um, you know, like I was saying, there's then a whole host of uh, uh, retrospective data. We ourselves even did a retrospective data here. 1,500 patients who had acute chest pain, they had nuclear imaging within 24 hours. We followed them up for cardiac events. You know, if you kind of get a feel for these patients, they're the low to intermediate risk. They're 55 years old. Most of them didn't have coronary artery disease. They had some risk factors. TIMI scores is usually around two. Um, they all got mostly adenosine spect. And the abnormalcy rate, look at that, it, only 8.6%. So vast majority of these patients we're scanning, you know, are normals. Um, um, and the EFs were normal. And you can see that, you know, if you look at outcomes, that if you have a normal a nuclear myocardial perfusion study here, we followed patients out to seven months, you know, they did extremely well. Whereas if you have a positive score, um, uh, then, you know, the, the, these patients generally end up having something. Uh, and most of this was driven by revascularization. Uh, the study we also showed that, you know, you can risk stratify patients based on the amount of perfusion defect score they had. The worse the defect, the worse they did. Similarly, the amount of ischemia that they had, you could risk stratify them. Um, and then um, this was just a nice, you know, a lot of statistical analysis, but basically if you look at the global chi-square, just showing that when you add nuclear imaging on top of two clinical risk factors, clinical risk scores, you significantly increase your global chi-squared, indicating that, you know, um, you have a much more better ability to prognosticate risk compared to clinical variables. Yeah, um, so this was data, mo most of the acute chest pain population are patients without CAD, so you're, most of those are excluded from these trials. These are mostly patients who come in without any prior history and are, you know, the CAD population, the diagnosis is there, then it's trying to figure out whether they have ischemia or not. Okay, and in this trial, you know, we also showed, ex oh, now, so if you look at, like I was saying, if you look at other, apart from our study, if you look at other retrospective studies that are out there, you can see that the negative predictive value of SPECT here, again, was very similar to the randomized control data, very, very high 90s. Okay, so what about coronary CT? CT is a little bit different, right? Now we're not looking at really at functional information. We're more looking at anatomy. We're looking at coronary, the, we're looking at coronary patency. And we're able to do this because of tremendous high spatial resolution. Now, believe it or not, there's a lot of very solid literature here. And uh, this, there's four randomized trials representing almost 2,000 patients, all compared to standard of care. Some standard of care was whatever the doctors wanted. Some standard of care was nuclear imaging. So, um, yeah, so you know, very ro robust clinical trials. Follow-up time in all these studies ranged anywhere from 30 days to around six months. Uh, four trials, we've talked about some of these in the years past um, in uh, Dr. Pratt's uh, conferences. But main thing I want you to know, Again, these are low to intermediate risk cohorts. You know, these are patients not with known coronary artery disease. Uh, their mean age is usually around 50 to 60. They have a few risk factors. Their TIMI scores are between one and two. And if you actually look at the overall incidence of acute coronary syndromes in this population, it was 4%. And even our own data from our own lab will show, uh, I will show you similar numbers, four to 5%. So this is a patient population <laughs> Um, I'm sure Dr. Q will bring out is that no matter maybe whatever you do to them, you know, whatever test you use, because the events are so low, uh, most tests are going to have high negative predictive values. <coughs>
So that's why a lot of the emphasis on these trials isn't about, you know, does this test work or not? It's about which one is faster compared to the other one, because most of these tests do very well. So if you look in, you know, if you look at this data a little bit closer, these four randomized trials in meta-analyses, you know, first they show that doing the CT strategy where you only need one troponin and one EKG and you take them straight away to the CT lab, it's safe if you compare it to standard of care. There was no difference in death of myocardial infarction compared to the standard of care group. But what was, in, what was help, where CT differed was if you look at the time to diagnosis. And in every trial that it was studied, it significantly led to a faster time to diagnosis. And what that ended up resulting in was that the overall duration of the hospital course was significantly less on the range of you know, a quarter. And as a, as a result, that directly translates into lower emergency room costs. And it's easy. The less time they're there, the less nursing you need, less doctor time, less medications, less, you know, whatever, IVs. So the faster you can get, make a correct diagnosis on these patients safely and get them home, the hospital and the system saves money. And that's what every trial that was studied with CTA compared to either nuclear or standard of care uh, demonstrated that. Um, and this is just one such example to kind of give you a feel. Uh, you know, this was data from the Roman CAT trial. And you can see that the, by, let's say, if you're looking at proportion of patients, 50% of patients discharge. With CT strategy, you know, you got there a lot faster in 8.6 hours versus where there are other techniques. And that kind of makes sense. You know, if you're doing a rest-stress protocol, that can take close to three to four hours to do. And then you, you know, have, you have you know, the study being interpreted, et cetera, et cetera. So CT, they come there, you give a little bit of beta blockers, nitro, 15 minutes, and you have, you know, you're, you're getting your answer. Um, but there are some interesting caveats that were noted in this meta-analysis. Number one, if you looked at those patients who had CT strategy, there was actually an increase in the ra uh, rate of both invasive cornea angiography and PCI on the order of about 20 per thousand cases. But there was a trend towards more procedures. Um, and the reason for that is, again, you're seeing anatomy, you see an, a, a blockage, and you know, the next step for us is you know, uh, to, to pursue some uh, further anatomical imaging. Um, but what was interesting was, at least in Romicat 2, that even though there's a trend towards more procedures, they showed that the hospital cost in general was balanced. And the way they kind of, you know, that, you know, and not all the studies also had this finding, but the way they kind of resolved this was that, you know, we're sending home a vast majority of patients very, very quickly. And yes, you know, there is an expense with the few patients that we do end up sending to the cath lab to get stented. But all in all, it seems to be balancing, at least in the Romy cat study. So it was an interesting observation, but I think the most important thing is the long-term impact of to the total hospital stay, to the healthcare system, you know, what it means, what, how the physicians use the data when they see the patients in clinic, yet to be determined, uh, and then, as you know, uh, can be very difficult to determine as well. Okay. The other thing I'd like to add about CT, you know, is there is this put, as you know, CT shows incredible anatomy. And, and the, as these two stud images show you, we see incredible amounts of atherosclerotic plaque. So there's this whole concept or theory that, you know, of able to identify atheros with CT, you can obviously identify atherosclerotic plaque that may be non-obstructive much earlier than you can with myocardial perfusion imaging. So the theory is that it, using a technique like this, you can get these patients on correct medical therapy um, um, even you know, uh, earlier in time and hopefully, hopefully change the, their prognosis. Again, this is all conjecture, it's not been proven, but some things you should uh, you know, keep your ears out open for in the future that uh, as they try to do comparative analysis studies uh, between techniques, that with CT, you have the opportunity to get on med medication sooner. So we also did our own trials in this field. We also had a randomized trial. We randomized about 600 patients to cardiac CT. 
uh, with standard of care here, mostly nuclear imaging. We did things a little bit differently, and I'm kind of proud of that. You know, compared to the literature, we on our CT arm, we had a calcium scoring data, which was very interesting. And then on the standard of care side, um, um, uh, with our nuclear imaging, we actually do what we do every day. We do stress imaging first. So about 24% of the population here st had stress imaging. And all these po patients were followed up for six months, which generally has been you know, the higher time points compared to most of those other trials. If you look at the overall ACS event rate, it was no different from the four trials of 2,000 patients that I mentioned, right around 4%. So this was just some of the char clinical characteristics. Um, nothing different really, same stuff, middle age, 50s to 60s, couple of risk factors, Timmy scores between one and two. Um, um, so, uh, you know, um, uh, nothing too exciting. But what we showed was, you know, as you would have expected from these techniques, they're safe. Um, you know, if we say your study is normal, these patients have an excellent prognosis and therefore have a very high negative predictive value. Whereas if your study is abnormal, be it SPECT or CTA, you had uh, worsening survival. Uh, you had an increased uh, risk of MACE. Um, um, where our study was also very similar to what is published out there in the literature, if you look, compared those patients um, who underwent SPECT compared to those who went, underwent CTA, we showed a difference. We showed that, again, CTA was faster to diagnosis and then would therefore lead to hopeful uh, a quicker discharge of your patient. But what was, I think, most unique to our study and really was the first study to show this was, remember, 25% of our patients had uh, stress-only imaging. So when we compared those patients who had a normal stress-only image with those who had a normal CTA, which is these uh, images three and four, what you'll notice is the time curves are exactly the same. So, you know, it's not necessarily that CT is faster. It is a definitely a fast technique. But as with anything else, you know, uh, whatever imaging modality you're using, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, you know, you're going to get better results if you can optimize uh, those techniques for speed um, as well as accuracy. So this was one of the first studies to show that, that, you know, we could get comparable results to CT, at least time-wise, if we were using stress-only imaging. And this is just some time curves. I know they're kind of complicated here, but the red is stress-only imaging, and it sits right on top of the CT line, showing that you know, it was as fast. Uh, when we looked at radiation doses, you know, uh, with stress-only imaging, there was a significant um, reduction in dose compared to CT. But again, you know, I don't want to get too bogged down into radiation doses. These are all moving targets. You know, if you use CT, optimally for a, a, a dose reduction, and you're using a lot of our flash protocol, which is our high pitch, you know, um, uh, um, uh, technique, you know, your CT radiations, your doses are going to be very, very low. So it just depends on, you know, how you scan these patients. So all, all the techniques are involving when it comes to radiation dose. But again, in this technique, I think the most, uh, I, again, this was just another trial, just, you know, again, pounding it, you know, what we've already kind of seen. That again, in, in, in our study, if you had a normal spec, if you had a normal CTA, you know, you had these tests portended excellent prognosis, the negative predictive values were exceptionally high, concomitant to everything else you've seen in the literature. Um, I haven't talked much about calcium scoring. You remember all the CTA patients had calcium scoring. I will come back to that. Uh, we had about 53% 53, uh, 53 of our patients had a calcium score. Believe it or not, none of them had a coronary stenosis by CTA greater than 50%. None of them had any events. And in this study, if you look at it, the negative predictive accuracy, it was as good as uh, <coughs> SPECT or uh, CTA. I will come back to that. Um, okay, so just, you know, hint, again, trying to slide, trying to hint on the importance of, you know, really optimizing whatever technique you're using, really optimizing it best you can, uh, uh, in order to efficiently get these uh, patients through the system. So uh, there are going to be some big game changers coming up that we should be aware of. 
Um, and it, you know, already you've started hearing of the, about these in the stable coronary artery disease population, but they're equally relevant in the acute chest pain population. Some of the game changers that you will, will be hearing about are techniques that combine both anatomy and physiology together. So one example of this is CT perfusion, where not only do you have the, an anatomical imaging of the coronary arteries, but you have simultaneous concomitant um, myocardial stress perfusion imaging as well. Now, you know, here you are giving a stressor agent as well. Um, um, so, you know, um, you, th this is something to look out for in the uh, literature, at least in the ED, uh, ED literature. The second thing that I personally think w will probably be more significant is, of course, this whole like, concept of CTFFR, where based on your anatomy, you can predict function. And, um, and, and here, this is the benefit without need for any stress. So your patient doesn't need any discomfort, doesn't need extra any IVs. Just, one data set is collected, and you're able to get a concomitant anatomical assessment as well as functional assessment. There's been no randomized trial with any of these techniques in the acute chest pain setting. Um, I won't leave CMR out. Uh, CMR is also a very valid technique. Can, 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 there are three major trials that have uh, been looked at in the acute chest pain population. I'll give kudos to CMR in the sense that they actually used higher risk patients than what were used in all the other techniques. And the, thought that, and the reason for that, at least what they r write in the literature, is because your ability to tell infarct from ischemia so well, you have LGE. Uh, one of the studies that I, all three have generally the same um, results, so I'm going to specifically talk about the last study, which was the largest study. This was a trial in which patients were randomized to a CMR strategy versus standard of care, again, standard of care being whatever the physician wanted to choose. And what it consistently showed was that if you use CMR, it did lead to um, decreased hospital admissions, less revascularization, less recurrent diagnostic texting, um, uh, less index uh, length of stay, all without any adverse uh, safety events. So again, uh, uh, another very valid technique in the um, um, assessment of acute chest pain. So now um, I have 10 more minutes, <coughs> a few more minutes. Um, so what about calcium scoring? Well. <clears throat> there is no randomized trial yet uh, or uh, evaluating acute uh, calcium scoring in the acute chest pain population, but there's a lot of d data out there that shows that it can be, a, it's a very interesting technique to consider. Um, we know that those who have a calcium score, you rarely do you observe an abnormal spect, rarely do they have significant CAD, and they definitely don't have any, rarely have myocardial infarction. So there, we had a very large pers prospective cohort, 5,000 patients who had SPECT imaging, and in this group we, had, we obtained a concomitant calcium score. And uh, this baseline characteristics, again, no different from what you have seen in an low to intermediate risk population. And what you saw was, and this is again data from our own lab, very similar to, consistent with all the prior studies we have done, and very consistent with the data that I've shown you from other institutions. If you looked at the rate of normalcy of a nuclear exam, 96%. So vast majority of studies are normal. And in our cohort here, remember this is almost oh, slightly greater than 1,000 patients, 61% had a calcium score uh, of zero. And what we found was that you can actually risk stratify these patients based on their calcium score, you know, uh, um, um, both by their percent abnormalcy of SPECT, as this slide shows, that as your calcium score increases, your risk of an abnormal SPECT progressively increases. Um, calcium scores greater than 400% in our study have had high as, as high as 20%, whereas we had a few patients, 0.5 patients in our calcium score zero cohort who had an abnormal SPECT. Um, we'll come back to those. If we look at event rates, again, you see this very graded relationship between the degree of atherosclerotic plaque as indicated by the calcium score and their risk for a cardiac event. So as their calcium score increased, their risk of cardiac events increased. As, um, um, so uh, whereas you, we only had two patients with a calcium score zero, 
who had a cardiac event. We'll talk about those two patients a little further here. Same data with SPECT. If your SPECT is abnormal, you know, you, you had, you, there's, you know, it, risk of revascularization was high, whereas if you had normal, very few <coughs> patients uh, went on to have MACE. Um, uh, and in this study, you know, we showed a negative predictive value with calcium scoring as good, again, as, as with our uh, SPECT. Now, um, again, in the very, very high 90s. So what about some of those patients that I mentioned who had some abnormal studies? So if you looked at those with calcium score zeros and the five patients who had an abnormal SPECT, four of them had normal left heart cath, so they were actually false positive nuclears. And one of them, we, we just don't know, uh, they were treated medically and you know, didn't have a cath and there were no events in follow-up. There were two patients who had events, both of them were some troponitis, uh, they, and during follow-up uh, of over seven months, there were no events observed, so I'm not sure what to make of that. But if you look at the literature that's been now published, almost uh, 2,000 patients, you can see the findings that we had with a negative predictive value of 99% is uh, similar to now, you know, what's been shown in the literature, multiple uh, different studies, different sites. Uh, ours was the largest cohort, you know, exact same finding. So something interesting, you know, uh, we, you know, maybe in the future we can talk about. Um, and you all, all know the benefits of calcium score. It literally is 15 second exam and can be interpreted by an ER doc. So it's pretty straightforward. So um, what are my, I'm going to conclude here because our main speaker is coming up. Um, what are my take home points? The take home points are, you know, this is a big problem. We have over 8 million patients per year seeking care for acute chest pain in the U.S. Uh, it leads to, you know, we need more rapid cost effective diagnostic techniques. Uh, there are multiple randomized trials. I've shared, shared with you only randomized trials that have uh, shown you uh, the benefits of non-invasive imaging. Uh, showing it to be safe and effective in expediting care and reducing hospital admissions. Uh, we have some upcoming disruptive technologies, which I think all of y'all, we should, I think as a group, plan something. You know, we, we can get involved in this field and really answer some in interesting questions. We have combined anatomical functional imaging, either with CT perfusion or CTFFR. We have this whole calcium scoring, you know, that has, can be explored further. And who knows what's going to happen once high, high sensitivity uh, troponin hits the U.S. So a lot of, I think this field is really ripe for a lot of very good research. And um, love to see what Dr. Q has to say. So I'd like to talk to um, touch on two points. So one is the role of the echocardiography, and then at the end, I'd like to touch on an interesting development that I think might change how we all practice in a few years. So echo, right? So you already have heard you know, the common algorithm. Patient comes in, they have an uh, EKG that doesn't diagnose anything, they have normal enzymes, we put them in observation, and then we do a stress test, okay? So obviously, one of the options in that stress test algorithm is to do a stress echo. Um, so with stress echo, of course, we are looking at um, we are looking at the function of the heart, uh, rest with exercise, and in this case, you see a nice ischemia occurring with a treadmill. And frequently when uh, we did studies of both SPECT and nuclear, which were done over 10 years ago, uh, close to 300 patients that in the same treadmill had both echo and nuclear, uh, there was a lot of concordance, actually 85% concordance um, in terms of um, calling it a positive or negative test, not always in the same territories, although that was greater than two thirds concordance in terms of territories. And subsequently, there's been meta-analyses that have shown um, that in fact, they have reasonable sensitivities. I think that in some studies, particularly when you bring pharmacologic stress echo, different to just exercise, um, SPEC does have a higher sensitivity. And then the stress echo, which either technique tends to have a little bit of a higher specificity than nuclear. <coughs> 
And we've talked about these things earlier when we have given talks on both stress nuclear and stress echo, so I'm going relatively fast over these. We also know that stress echo provides an excellent um, prediction of outcomes in terms of normal versus abnormal. Uh, again, from this group of patients that had both tests simultaneously and were followed for five years, very similar outcomes prediction for both tests. With the treadmill having the advantage, same thing would be for spec, by the way, that if you add the treadmill data, SSI duration, ST changes, pain, and whatnot, then you can have a whole index which would incorporate not just your imaging findings. In the case of stress echo, it would be the, the one motion score, but it could be you know, a perfusion deficit uh, by spec, together with the treadmill time, symptoms, and whatnot. So you can incorporate all of that and even have a much higher prediction of events in time to come. Now, I have this slide for the vitamin stress to show you that yes, it can be done, and we do it, and this is a nice positive. Somebody that has a perfectly normal heart address, and then with stress develop a significant abnormality in the LAD distribution. However, if a patient can exercise, exercise stress echo is always preferred. So the butamine is left for patients that cannot exercise, and again, remember, we're talking today of the emergency department setting patient that comes into the ED, and many of them are obese, they have orthopedic issues, so they may not necessarily be able to exercise. And in that situation, I think still SPEC is superior. I think when we see a patient with chest pain, either in the observation area or the um, ED, that cannot exercise, I think we get more bang for our bucks if we go with uh, regadenosin, uh, nuclear done with a dobutamine stress. We have talked about this when I gave the talk on stress echo. Dobutamine stress have issues when you have small hearts, and particularly with LVH. And a lot of these people are, hyperten hi are hypertensive. And you will have some hi a higher yield of false negative with dobutamine that you will have with um, nuclear. And, in term, and then in, in top of that, you do have the one percent fibrillation, the certain nausea that some people can have. So I think from a point of view of overall side effects and greater accuracy, if a patient cannot exercise, I think we really should go the way of um, uh, regadenosone or adenosine, which in fact is what happens today. I think we rarely see somebody coming for a dobutamine stress from uh, observation area or the amazing department. Both tests are approved by the guidelines, and they're all considered appropriate, so that is not an issue. You will get paid by any of them. Now, I like to put this slide here because the role of echo in chest pain, medicine department, is really stress echo. So what does a resting echo offers? A resting echo only offers you data if the patient has abnormal EKG. Q ways, ST, LVH, ST changes, things that suggest maybe a myocardial process of some kind. It could be ischemic, it could be non-ischemic. If a patient has already known CAD with previous MI, or the, if they have dyspnea, in, in that setting, then being able to see LVH, EF, wall motion changes if any address, particularly the stolic function, pulmonary pressures, all those things then do add information that is valuable for the care of that patient. If you're suspicious of pericarditis, of course, and you see a pericardial effusion, that can be helpful. However, many of our patients in the emergency department don't have any of that. And in that setting, it's worthless. So we should try to reduce the use of resting echoes in the setting that, in, that probably covers 60% of people coming to DD. It's a waste of money, it's a waste of time. Patients there are waiting to be discharged and you're being, uh, you're being tortured in the echo lab because they want the echo result, which is normal. So um, really, it's a waste of resources, and we should try to do everything we can uh, to persuade doctors against it. I'm going to be giving a talk this Saturday to the hospitalists on management of chest pain, and I will be making this very strong statement also there. Now, this is a typical patient, right? Comes in with chest pain, have had previous um, problems, and you can see that there is issues with uh, Echinesis of the apex, uh, inferior base, EF is down. These are the most difficult patients. This is where you really need a cardiologist. So the most difficult patient from the ED to manage is the patient with known disease. They still may have non-cardiac chest pain, 
But the problem is now we know they have chest pain. Those patients are tougher, uh, they're more difficult. A CTA may not help you at all because they have CAD. So the, you, know, you, you, you may want a CTA if you're concerned that maybe they had a stent four months ago and the stent could be occluding. But most of the time, in that setting of a non-CAD patients, we're going, to do in, we're going to go in the way of two, two, two directions. Either we're going to do some type of, of stress test like a regadenosone or even maybe a dobutamine in that setting to look for issues with viability ischemia because they already have an abnormal LV, or we're going to go to the CAS lab. You know, or, or we're going to put them in and get a bunch more enzymes and whatnot. So clearly, this is the most difficult patient. Luckily, it's the minority of patients walking into emergency room uh, with acute chest pain. But they are the headaches, and we all have patients that tend to be uh, frequent flyers. We all know them. They come in three, two or three times a year. They all have CAD. We all have, they have been cast several times, and they keep coming back. And, and they are probably the most difficult patients to take care of. So um, this is somebody with pericarditis, just to show you. OK, so this is the algorithm that we use, right? Um, we have the history. Patient has no clear etiology. Then we put them observation, and we do some testing. Test testing, you heard about CTA and the value that it has. Now, what about cardiac enzymes? So th what I wanted to finish with you is some data that I think you all, or so many of you are familiar with is this issue of the very high sensitive cardiac troponin assays, which there is sensitive and there's very high sensitive. And some of those very high sensitive um, assays are still undergoing uh, approval in the US. So we don't have them today uh, in America. But the data is very, very powerful. This is a study in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what you see here is uh, the standard assays in gray, and these are four different types of very, very, very sensitive troponin T. And all the people that had uh, a, uh, a, 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 um, myocardial infarctions, acute events, they all had very high levels. People with unstable angina tend to have a little higher level. Cardiac causes, but no CAD, you know, myocarditis. We, we've seen uh, uh, lectures in myocarditis, how you can obviously spell troponin, even amyloidosis. So they will have, but then you have the, the people that represent the two-thirds of people we see in the, in the ED, very, very low levels. So that was one paper. And then this one came out this past year, uh, following outcomes. And the strength of this paper that was published in JAK was 66,000 patients. I mean, when you have that kind of volume, you, you, have, some, you have some credibility, all right? And this was a, a, a Swedish study. And they compare the traditional assay with this very high sensitive uh, assay. And uh, the data is, I can read it here, but it's shown better in this particular figure from their paper. So what we have here are, they, have, they did two things. They have the group that passed the test and went home. The group that was admitted for further testing. So in the group that went home, just like our own data and every other study that is, is done, in the emergency department, they had lower risk profiles. You know, that's, um, Faisal showed that beautifully. Um, look at the events rates. They were as low as what we have shown with normal specs, uh, normal calcium scores, uh, normal stress echo, whatever, you name it. The group that was admitted, obviously, already had higher, um, had higher risk factors, and therefore, they, this is the group that included more problems, and even after discharge, you know, if they have a very a, a, a positive, very high sensitive troponin, had higher 30-day event rates than if they didn't. And that makes sense. This would be higher than this, because now this is a selected group that came into the hospital because they had some issues. So a uh, very, very strong paper uh, just recently published, which could make us think that in the future, well, we might be going from a history EKG, the high, ens the high sensitive enzymes, if a patient has uh, acute coronary syndrome, no, no problem. They go straight to, to admission for treatment. If they have normal enzymes, they go home. And then we have this group that may have positive enzymes, but everything looks, looks very low risk except for the elevation, where we might still put them in observation and still go through the same testing that we're currently doing, whether it's a stress test, whether it's a CTA, or, or whatever. So we could be seeing this algorithm uh, developing, uh, which could possibly get rid of half of the patients coming to the emergency room.
So stay tuned because obviously that's still awaiting uh, use in the uh, approval for use in the, in the US. Very important message. My last message I leave with you, I think Faisal will 100% agree. These are people coming to the medicine room. So we took care of them. We decided they did not have a cardiac cause of chest pain and that it was safe to go home. That doesn't mean that they don't have risk for the future, right? Hypertension, high cholesterol. So these people always should have some level of follow-up because many of these people, if you sit down with them and you do your little risk profile, you know, they fall in the, in the greater than 10% risk. So these are people that should not just say, hey, you're doing great, you're immortal, go home and, and enjoy life. They really, sh if they don't have a system of care, should be placed in a system of care that can further evaluate them and provide uh, adequate preventive uh, care. So with that, we will finish, and uh, we have time for some questions. Direct them all to Faisal. <laughs> <laughs>